Thank you very much, John, for that nice introduction. World revolution. Really? Against whom? Yes, we see political revolutions, wars, a revolution in Catholicism and in Christian morality. But it's almost impossible to see that these are stitched together in a grand design, forming the tapestry of world revolution that is reaching its apogee in our time. Only when we study today's problems through a supernatural lens in the light of unchanging truth does the grand design emerge. The popes, especially from Leo XIII to Pius XII, exposed this design, which was becoming obvious in the 19th century. The revolution was initiated by Satan in the Garden of Eden, and his goal is to rule the entire universe. In his 1884 encyclical on Freemasonry, Humanum Genus, Pope Leo XIII explained that the fall divided mankind into two opposing camps the kingdom of God on earth, which is the Catholic Church, and the kingdom of Satan, which includes all those who work against God and against his church. These kingdoms have always been at war, but by the end of the 19th century, he said, the partisans of evil seem to be combining together, led on or assisted by the Freemasons. No longer making any secret of their purposes, they are now boldly rising up against God himself. They are planning the destruction of Holy Church publicly with the set purpose of utterly despoiling Christendom of the blessings obtained through Jesus Christ. The revolution is thus against the Catholic Church, the Christian old world order, and even God himself. A luminous Freemasonry intends to replace them with its new order, its new world order of a universal socialist occult republic. Freemasonry is a highly occult society. Its world community, called Universal Brotherhood, will impose the worship of Lucifer through a totalitarian one world government and the occult one world religion of the Antichrist. In 1937, Pope Pius XI specifically warned of occult forces working for the overthrow of the Christian social order. Now, the grand design of the revolution is summarized by St. Thomas Aquinas. Quote, there are two mystical bodies in this world, the mystical body of Christ and the mystical body of the devil or antichrist. To one or another, every man belongs. The mystical body of Christ is the Holy Church, his pure and faithful spouse. The mystical body of the devil is the ensemble of impious men. Like an adulterous wet nurse, it nourishes this ensemble. The devil is its head, and the evil persons are its members. Just as Christ, in himself and through his disciples, always seeks to cut off the members of the devil and incorporate them to himself, so also does the devil. By his efforts and those of his cohorts, the devil aims to amputate the members of Christ to unite them to the sordid members of his prostitute." End of quote. Establishing an entire new world order requires a world revolution. In his 1878 encyclical condemning socialism, Pope Leo said the revolutionaries formed a global army. We speak of that sect of men, he said, who are called socialists, communists, or nihilists, and who spread over all the world and bound together in a wicked confederacy, openly strive to bring to a head what they have long been planning, the overthrow of all civil society. By 1885, the revolution had spread worldwide. Note that the difference between socialism and communism is basically only in name. Both work for Freemasonry. Communists themselves, such as Gorbachev, equate socialism with communism. Commenting on the Western claim that communism was dead when the Soviet Union was dismantled, he said, it is wrong to insist that this is the collapse of socialism. 
the socialist process in the world will pursue its further development in a multiplicity of forms. One form is manipulating language to fool the masses. Socialism is benign. Democracy is the greatest good. But Marx, Engels, and other revolutionaries were socialists aligned with various democratic movements. Freemasonry itself is considered the most ancient and the most revered of democratic societies. Promoting liberty, equality, and the rule of the proletariat, as well as the Masonic war against throne and altar, so-called democracy is actually a communist instrument. Lenin equated democracy with socialism and communism. So, when countries or the UN war against a nation to install democracy, they are going to install communism. True democracy acknowledges that God, not the people, is the source and holder of authority. One has to obey lawful authority, and his church has the right to teach and influence every part of society. But, as Pope Leo stated, the revolution is directed precisely at this right. Masonry, he said, seeks to exclude every Catholic or clerical element from all public administrations, from hospitals, schools, governments, companies, families, and exclusion from everything, everywhere, and forever. Instead, the Masonic influence is to make itself felt in all the circumstances of social life and to become controller of everything. The battle cry of the revolution is liberty, equality, and fraternity, which is a slogan from the Masonic French Revolution. And it hides under the euphemisms of democracy, solidarity, community, brotherhood, justice, love. It justifies wars and revolutions for peace. It's the basis for human rights declarations that deny the rights of God, his church, and individuals, and it has enabled the growth of the kingdom of Satan. Liberating man from the law of God makes him a slave of the devil. Now, the Communist Manifesto of 1848, which was commissioned by the Illuminati, lists the principles of the revolution. Let me quote. The communist revolution involves the most radical rupture with traditional ideas. Communism abolishes eternal truths. It abolishes all religion and all morality. Communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order. Their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. End of quote. Communism is thus not just an economic system opposed to capitalism. From its own mouth, it's a total revolution, sheer anarchy. Indeed, it took over from the anarchists of the French Revolution, and its manifesto is very much in operation today. 19th century Russian nihilism prepared the way for the anarchists and socialists. Nihilists have the same revolutionary goals, materialism, complete individual liberty, and the use of violence to affect their agenda. Nihilists were total anti-religious rationalists. They rejected all traditional political and religious norms. They wanted a completely new society. Nihilism under, underpinned the struggle for political and social emancipation. In his encyclical on liberty, Pope Leo XIII shows the moral and political results of nihilism and rationalism. First, quote, once man is firmly persuaded that he is subject to no one, it follows that the authority in the state comes from the people only. Every man's individual reason is his only rule of life. So the collective reason of the community is the supreme guide in all public affairs. Hence the doctrine that all right resides in the majority." End of quote. That is, rationalism makes man God and a united collective a pantheistic God. So communism requires absolute unanimity. 
Today's mania for community, with the mirage of a divine one-world community ever beckoning, is pure Marxism. This ideal was embraced by the condemned modernist Teilhard de Chardin and became church policy at Vatican II. Cardinal Ratzinger acknowledged that Teilhard's daring vision of evolution towards a divine world strongly influenced the council, especially the document Gaudium et Spes. Pope Leo continues, if reason is the only authority, then the distinction between good and evil becomes a matter of opinion. Pleasure is the measure of what is lawful. The rational's code of, mor of morality results in universal corruption. Today's secular humanist revolt furthers the Masonic plan to control people through the gospel of pleasure, allowing the multitudes a boundless license of vice weakens wills and easily subjects them to control. The Pope observed that wherever Christian education was removed, morals perished and evil deeds abounded. Secular humanism is the foundation of today's education systems, even in Catholic schools. Politically speaking, said the Pope, the empire of God over man and civil society once repudiated it follows that religion as a public institution can have no claim to exist. That is no claim to influence civil authority. Laws are at the mercy of a majority. This is the democratic revolt, which has destroyed the public influence of the Catholic Church. It's a road leading to tyranny, said the Pope. Catholic teaching based on divine law enables public and private tranquility. Without it, he said, with ambitious designs on sovereignty, tumult and sedition will be common. Force alone cannot keep covetousness in check. Covetousness underpins class warfare and insurrection against even the democratically elected governments. For instance, the recent Occupy movement and Day of Rage protests against economic inequality were communist-backed. The protesters, and also the Arab Spring revolutionaries, were inspired by a French Hegelian anarchist by the name of Stéphane Hessel. In a 2010 book, he encouraged youth to express indignation at anything that they think is unjust. His slogan, to resist is to create, echoes the anarchist creed of the 19th century Russian revolutionary Bakunin. Bakunin is the father of modern anarchism. He declared, the passion for destruction is a creative passion. He was an illuminist, Satanist, Hegelian, and an associate of Marx and Engels. Bakunin's call for a total social revolution by organizing and linking every group of people into building blocks of the new society is the New Age philosophy of networking and its latest extension, social networking. Not only are Facebook and Twitter forging a global mindset, but Twitter has become the tool for rapidly convening a mob. Bakunin rejected hierarchy and all authority from God down. He believed all states are despotic because they express the interests of the ruling class. Ruling class would include the pope and clergy. Any inequality is a class difference and undemocratic. Hence, we have the democratic, Catholic, anti-clerical movement since Vatican II which has been encouraging the laity into taking over the work of the clergy. And the new ecclesial movements are even equated with the bishops. This is the back door to destroying the church's hierarchical structure. Bakunin thought that the revolution must simultaneously destroy the old order and take on a federalist and anarchistic direction. And this principle was the germ of the future United Nations. Women are considered essential tools of the revolution. Like other communists, 
Bakunin appealed to women by portraying the inequality of men and women as a class difference and gender oppression. Feminism from its inception in the 19th century has been part of communism and has played a major role in the destruction of marriage, the family, and morality. It's a major era of Russia. Bakunin and another Russian revolutionary by the name of Nekayev set down the principles of anarchy in their Catechism of a Revolutionary. Let's look at some of the main points which are operational today. The revolutionary anarchist is described as follows. He has severed every link with the social order and with the entire civilized world, with the laws, good manners, conventions, and morality of that world. He is its merciless enemy and continues to inhabit it with only one purpose, to destroy it. Anarchist Catholic feminists brought this revolution into the church, claiming that women have been marginalized and oppressed. But they remain in the Catholic Church in order to change it. Many uprisings today involve college students. That's not surprising, because Bakunin's ideal revolutionaries are educated, unemployed youth, as well as the poor, marginalized, and criminal elements. His program calls for seemingly spontaneous uprisings that are actually directed by secret cabals. Secret anarchists are then immersed in mass uprisings, directing them towards overthrowing the forces of the state. Notice how so many peaceful demonstrations suddenly turn violent, then the police or the military react, then the government is denounced, and the West supports its ouster. Terrorism is an option. Although terrorist activity sometimes to, seems to be a solo act, it's more likely that the terrorist is following orders from a secret cabal as per the catechism's principles. He must also be prepared to destroy himself. So the phenomenon of Muslim suicide bombers suggests that Islamic terrorism is another strand of the communist revolution. Blackmailing the elite to help the revolution is another principle, and undoubtedly it's used within the church. Now, communism is not atheism. Like its father Lucifer, it knows there's a true God, it hates him, and it wishes to replace him with the divine mankind. It aims to erase him from human consciousness. The idea of God, said Bakunin, implies the abdication of human reason and justice. It is the most decisive negation of human liberty and necessarily ends in the enslavement of mankind. Consequently, if God really existed, it would be necessary to abolish him. This is the ideology of secular humanism. Examples abound of attempts to abolish God, especially Jesus Christ, from society and even from the Catholic faith. Pope Leo had already observed attempts by Freemasonry in Italy and Rome to lay aside everything by removing the mark of Christianity from it. Pius XI affirmed, communism has striven to destroy Christian civilization and the Christian religion by banishing every remembrance of them from the hearts of men, especially of the young. And increasing barbarity is a result of this. Multiculturalism and separation of church and state are erasing Christ from public consciousness. Here are some examples. In order not to allegedly offend non-Christians, Christ has been removed from prayers in government schools and at public interfaith gatherings. Christmas crushes are banished from many public areas. The word holiday is replacing Christmas. Increasingly, from Masonry's indifferentist tolerance of all religions, democratic governments are moving towards intolerance and persecution. Canada's province of Quebec is considering a law banning the wearing of any religious item from hijabs to crosses by government employees. 
doctors, nurses, teachers, and daycare workers will be fired if they don't conform. The Premier of Quebec declared, we don't want children exposed to religious influences in the public sphere. And this intolerance is going into the Quebec Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms. The US military has been attempting to prevent Catholic chaplains from preaching the faith. Soldiers, including chaplains, can be court-martialed for proselytism. A Pentagon consultant on religious tolerance in the military has called Christians threats to national security and enemies of the state who should be punished for treason and sedition for sharing their faith with a comrade. Unfortunately, governments are emboldened by the Catholic Church, which discourages the old evangelization. It denigrates attempts to carry out Christ's mandate to teach and convert all nations as proselytism because it endangers the ecumenical program of universal brotherhood. In 2007, Pope Benedict told Latin American bishops, the church does not engage in proselytism. Instead, just as Christ draws all to himself by the power of his love culminating in the sacrifice of the cross, so the church has to be a missionary of this love. This is the new evangelization begun by John Paul and confirmed by Pope Benedict. It's a tolerant, happy humanitarianism with no talk of sin, conversion, sacrifice, reparation, or hellfire. It makes the Fatima message irrelevant. The new evangelization is epitomized by World Youth Day, which waters down Christ's redemption. Jesus has been removed from his cross, which is subjected to enculturated idolatry on its travels. Official statements reveal that Christ's passion and death have it reinterpreted to an icon of God's love for mankind's suffering. As a sop to multiculturalism, the crucifix which symbolizes the exclusivity of Catholicism, that is, that salvation is only through the Catholic Church, was changed to the empty cross, which symbolizes universal salvation and a religion concerned only with improving man's temporal well-being. We imitate Christ by carrying our cross in solidarity with the world's suffering masses, so that, as Gordon at Space explains, the effort to establish a universal brotherhood will not be in vain. The Stations of the Cross at World Youth Day and at Papal Good Friday Stations are themed around some human suffering. Instead of being a meditation on the need for repentance in solidarity with Christ's suffering for our eternal salvation. Archbishop Fulton Sheen predicted that communism would produce a new religion without a cross. And blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich also foretold a false church without a redeemer, having only temporal action. This false faith growing within the Catholic Church indicates a terrible disorientation in Catholic thinking. This disorientation results from what George Orwell called doublethink. Doublethink follows from the basic principle of communist morality, which Bakunin described as follows. Everything is moral, which contributes to the triumph of the revolution. Immoral and criminal is everything which hinders it. Because of the absolute obedience expected from party members, this perverted principle gave rise to what is known as the party line, or doublethink. Namely, party members must believe what leaders tell them is correct, even if they know it's wrong. Thus, an ex-communist explained, slave labor and killings in German camps were considered immoral, but in Soviet gulag camps were considered moral. Stalin said the gulag camps served the revolution, and this made them moral. A disoriented person is confused, 
or lost. The diabolical disorientation is confusion caused by satanic deception in which evil disguised as good lures men into the kingdom of Satan who promises a new world order of peace and harmony. But that's a mirage, and one gets lost trying to reach it. Since the papacy of John XXIII, doublethink has gradually been disorienting Catholics. Without leaving the church, they have joined the imposter, which poses as a superior naturalistic social justice religion. This deceptive religion had already infected Italy in the late 19th century, and Pope Leo called it the Masonic Code of Revolution and remarked, the satanic intent of the persecutors has been to substitute naturalism for Christianity, the worship of reason for the worship of faith, so-called independent morality for Catholic morality, and material progress for spiritual progress. This inversion has been brought about through a series of steps termed the Hegelian dialectic. We cannot understand the revolution and the diabolical disorientation unless we understand Hegel's dialectic. It was derived from Johann Fichte, a German Mason with Illuminati connections. Marx, Engels, and other revolutionaries were Hegelians. <clears throat> Hegelian was a 19th century occultist who believed in social evolution to a higher spiritual level through a conflict of opposites. There is a control struggle between a thesis and its antithesis until a compromise synthesis is reached, which advances the illuminist goal. And the process is rep repeated many times over. The dialectic, therefore, engenders continuous change through conflict, which reorients man's thinking, drawing him bit by bit into the revolution. Differences might be concocted or prolonged to perpetuate conflict. Fascists versus communists, left versus right, traditionalists versus conservatives, children versus parents, pro-life versus pro-choice. Synthesis is evident in doublethink, in which one holds two opposing ideas at the same time, believing that both are correct, such as war is peace, or Christian Marxism. St. Paul warned that the Antichrist and his forerunners will overcome those who abandon tradition, who do not love the truth, which is found fully only in the Catholic Church, as punishment God will permit them to be led away with illusions and errors so that they will believe lying wonders and be condemned. According to an accepted interpretation, they are fooled by an ostentatious parade of zeal for the Holy Scriptures. Today's novelties are usually introduced as gospel values. And Pope Leo had already observed the craving to reconcile the maxims of the gospel with those of the revolution. Almost certainly, this delusion permitted by God as a punishment for the church's abandonment of tradition is what Sister Lucy in the 1970s termed a diabolical disorientation or confusion. In a series of writings that bear an imprimatur, she spoke of many being dominated by a diabolical wave sweeping the world, so they are blinded to the point of being incapable of seeing error and false doctrines. They have gone off the good road. Through his partisans within the church, the devil had infiltrated evil disguised as good, and churchmen allowed themselves to be deceived, whilst the simple faithful allow themselves to be swept away wherever their leaders direct them. That's in the direction of merger with the one world religion. Occultist Alice Bailey, who in the early 20th century set down the Masonic blueprint for the New World Order, stated that the church had to serve Masonic occultists in bringing in the New Order. It is meant to act as a precursor to the Antichrist by being the nucleus of world illumination. It has to develop wide tolerance and abandon tradition 
whilst preserving the outer appearances in order to deceive the masses. That's the key to the plan for the unbloody destruction of the faith. Discard tradition, but preserve the outer appearances. So the meaning of everything has to be changed. The mass, the sacraments, doctrine, prayer. The grassroots must be illumined, that is, re-educated, to accept new interpretations Illuminism is defined as the destruction of all old established systems and religions. And from the ashes arises the new kingdom of Lucifer, the great perversion. This anarchic technique of destruction and reconstruction is at work everywhere. The Hegelian dialectic is an important tool in this Illuminist restructuring. Double think produces double standards. What the church taught was wrong prior to Vatican II is not wrong today. What she believed then is not relevant now. Here are some examples of how the dialectic generates double think. Thesis, traditional Catholics. Antithesis, liberal Catholics. Synthesis, conservatives, who accept liberal ideas if promulgated by bishop or pope. Thesis, no women priests. Antithesis, women's ordination. Synthesis, women in lesser liturgical roles. Good conservatives have been similarly illumined to accept a new mass, an ecumenical rosary so-called by Pope John Paul II after he added in the luminous mysteries, communion in the hand, inculturated liturgies, Assisi-type prayer meetings. Their doubleting blanks out the promiscuous dangers of unmarried men and women traveling and sleeping together in fields when it's done to support the Pope at World Youth Day. The papal transition that took place this year synthesized monarchy and collegiality. It was a major step towards a democratic church of equals by reducing the office of the Supreme Pontiff to that of a bishop. Father Thomas Rosica, a spokesman for the, Holy Press, for the Holy See Press Office and head of the ecclesiastically approved Canadian media network Salt and Light, called it a change in direction. Yes, to help ecumenical relations, it turned the bark of Peter another degree away from tradition. Father Rosica said Pope Benedict's choice to retire was similar to that of other bishops, directly accusing the office of the papacy up till now of dictatorship, Father Rosica declared, the Pope is not an emperor for life, nor is he a super governor of churches. That is, he's just the ruler of his own diocese until he retires. Pope Francis, in his very first address, did emphasize that the conclave elected a bishop for Rome to replace Bishop Emeritus Benedict. And in a nod to equality, he asked the assembled people to pray over him before he blessed them. Father Rosica said Pope Benedict's resignation taught us the meaning of sweet surrender, of not clinging to power and the throne, of prestige, tradition, and privilege for their own sakes. This Masonic style attack on the primacy of Peter was an accusation of arrogance against all the popes and saints right back to St. Peter, including Pope Benedict's immediate predecessors. And yet, the church is canonizing two of them. Double think. They're arrogant, but they're holy. Now, after that step towards democracy, we see the step backwards. That is also part of the dialectical technique. For waiving the requirement of a miracle for John XXIII's canonization, as well as for approving the cause of Archbishop Romero that had been blocked by then Cardinal Ratzinger because of the Archbishop's ties to liberation theology, for doing these things, Pope Francis is seen as acting as an absolute monarch. Now, as always taught by the church, 
the primacy of the Roman pontiff is that of an absolute sovereign over the whole church and indeed the whole world. It was instituted by Jesus Christ when he told St. Peter, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. The Roman pontiff is a super governor, not just in matter of faith and morals, but the government of the entire church. But led astray by the controlled media, most Catholics don't know this. And so the confusion continues. The freeing of the traditional mass is a dialectical step backwards in preparation for the eventual merger of the two rites of mass. The diabolical disorientation has produced a Catholic spring, a Catholic revolution, part of the world revolution. The well-known 19th century preacher, Father Frederick Faber, anticipated the deception and said, if all the good men were on one side and all the bad men on the other, there would be no danger of anyone being deceived by lying wonders. Bear in mind this feature of the last days, that this deceitfulness arises from good men being on the wrong side. Popes in Pius X call these good men weak, cowardly Catholics. Sister Lucy spoke of fearful souls, including bishops, who do not fight the partisans of the devil. Now, according to St. Augustine and St. Thomas, choosing a false good, that is evil disguised as good, makes one a slave of the devil. Thus, the diabolical disorientation is a persecution. It's an error of Russia that Our Lady of Fatima warned would cause persecution. Now let's look briefly at, the, at what led up to her appearance at Fatima. Bakunin called for world revolution directed by Russia. He wrote, Russia is the goal of the revolution. Its greatest power will manifest itself there and there too it will achieve its perfection. In Moscow, from a sea of blood and fire, the star of the revolution will rise highly and nobly to become the guiding star for the salvation of all liberated humanity. Seemingly then, the Illuminati planned precisely which country would instigate world revolution, when it would happen, and who would lead it. The chosen leader was the anarchist Lenin. Churchill said Lenin, who was living in exile, was sent by Germany into Tsarist Russia to destroy it through the Bolshevist Revolution. The date was revealed 10 years before the revolution by an English Catholic priest and convert from Anglicanism, Robert Hugh Benson. He wrote in his 1907 novel, Lord of the World, quote, in 1917, communism really began. The new order began then. Benson's father was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he knew many powerful men. So possibly, Monsignor Benson had overheard them discuss plans for a world government. And his description of the revolution's progress into the 21st century closely matches what has already been happening. Consider, for example, what he said. Catholicism, now he's looking back from the 21st century, Catholicism had lost steadily for more than 50 years to the pantheistic religion of humanitarianism. Its creed is God is man. This similarity to the aftermath of Vatican II suggests that the council was planned before 1907. It would explain why masonry celebrated its opening. Here are some other examples. The world is now one. Universal brotherhood established. The humanity religion is the only one. The supernatural is dead. What remains is love and justice. Rome is bombed to smithereens, killing the Pope and nearly every cardinal. Is this the Masonic plan? Well, in 1946, Masonry's mouthpiece, Alice Bailey, wrote that the UN would destroy Rome with an atom bomb if the church did not cooperate. 
Now, after the Bolshevik Revolution, Lenin proclaimed, I don't care what becomes of Russia, to hell with it. All this is only the, world, uh, the road to a world revolution. A series of frightful collisions between the Soviet Republic and the bourgeois states will be inevitable. Like Marx, he considered the general havoc caused by war or violent revolution crucial for spreading communism. The greatest deception foisted on the world is that communism is dead. This allows it to work undetected and unchallenged. God, in his infinite mercy, sent his mother to Fatima in 1917 during the months of Bolshevik activity to give the Pope, not politicians or world leaders, the only means of saving the world from Russia. It was a nation under Satan. Communist leaders and revolutionaries were Satanist and Illuminati recruits. Russia was poised to become the Rome of the kingdom of Satan. Only God could stop her. So through the three children of Fatima, Our Lady told the church that Russia's errors would spread throughout the world, causing wars, the annihilation of various nations, and persecution of the church, unless the Pope and the bishops together would consecrate that country by name to her immaculate heart at a time that she would specify later. This collegial consecration, together with the first Saturday's devotion, would convert Russia, she promised, and give peace to the world. In 1921, Lenin's speech to the 10th Congress of the Communist Party revealed that Christian Europe was helping Russia. This is what he said. Aid is coming to us from the Western European countries and gathering strength. The world revolution has made a great step forward in comparison with last year. The Communist International, which last year existed merely in the form of proclamations, is now existing as an independent party in every country. In Germany, France, and Italy, the Communist International has become the focus of attention of their whole political life. This is our conquest, and no one can deprive us of it. The world revolution is growing stronger. This was a mere four years after Our Lady of Fatima warned that Russia would spread her errors around the world. And now the Russian revolution was worldwide. In 1929, with Stalin increasing the socialist offensive on all fronts, Our Lady appeared to Sister Lucy saying the moment had come for the consecration. But Pius XI and his successors have ignored God's peace plan until this day. So, as Our Lady warned in 1917, this disobedience immediately generated the punishment of the church and the world with Russia as God's chosen instrument of chastisement. In 1937, Pope Pius observed, Pope Pius XI, the revolution has actually broken out or threatens everywhere and it exceeds in amplitude and violence anything yet experienced in the preceding persecutions. Entire peoples find themselves in danger of falling back into a barbarism worse than that which oppressed the greater part of the world at the coming of the Redeemer. The instigator, he said, was Bolshevistic and atheistic communism. And the punishment of World War II began during the pontificate of Pius XI also as Our Lady had predicted, this facilitated penetration of the church. Pius XI, the first pope to ignore Our Lady, was himself ignored by his successor, Pius XII. Pius XI had stated, communism is intrinsically perverse, and no one who would save Christian civilization may collaborate with it in any undertaking whatsoever. Nevertheless, in 1941, Pius XII was deceived into permitting Catholics to fight alongside Stalin. Although since 1939, the Soviets had been on a genocidal rampage through Europe, directed especially against Catholics. Pius XII ignored Our Lady's promise of a period of world peace through the consecration of Russia. Instead, he believed President Roosevelt's promise of lasting peace through, 
cooperation with Russia. The 33rd degree Mason had just drawn up the foundational document for the United Nations, whose propaganda was that only Nazism was a menace to the world, and once it was defeated, there would be world peace. So Roosevelt promised the Pope, after winning the war, we shall seek the establishment of an international order in which the spirit of Christ will rule. I should say, ha. The United Nations is a major contributor to the diabolical disorientation. Its plan for peace is a plan for continuous war in order to manipulate nations into surrendering sovereignty to a world authority to obtain peace just as the Illuminati designed. The UN wasn't founded as a result of the war in 1945, but the war was used as a front for its founding in 1942, supposedly to prevent further wars, but actually to produce world government through war. The concept of a United Nations organization was sketched out by Bakunin. He envisaged a universal federation of peoples with free trade, no borders, an international parliament, tribunal, and executive committee based on the principles of the revolution. The international parliament would formulate common policy and make war in the name of the entire revolutionary federation. All members must participate in approved wars. Unapproved wars are unjust. The UN was founded on a lie. A communist organization from its inception, every part of it is working to bring about the Luciferian world order. By peace, the UN means the communist peace, in which all opposition is eliminated. Former UN Secretary General Yu Tan said, Lenin's ideals of peace, Lenin's ideals of peace are in line with the UN Charter. Yet, the diabolical delusion within the church is so strong that every pope since Pius XII has endorsed it. Pius had some doubts, but his successors have completely approved this anarchist organization which answers to nobody. Paul VI called it the last hope of concord and peace. Popes John Paul II and Benedict hoped the UN would become the moral center of the world. John XXIII and his successors also lauded the atheistic declaration of human rights. Pope Benedict termed the declaration the fundamental nucleus of values. But they're Illuminati values because the declaration is descended from the French Revolution and parallels the Soviet Constitution. So it's completely inimical to the rights of God and his church. The world wars were worked out according to the dialectical method with antagonists created and pitted against each other. And the same is taking place today in the Middle East right now. The wars follow the Illuminati principle of destruction and reconstruction, or what the Bush administration called creative destruction. Remember Bakunin said, the passion for destruction is a creative passion. During the Israeli war against Lebanon in July 2006, then Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice announced, what we're seeing here is the birth pangs of a new Middle East. It's a provoc uh, sorry, it's a new Middle East. That was in July 2006. In June 2006, a map of this new Middle East was published in a military journal circulated publicly and discussed at NATO's military college. It shows a completely restructured Middle East. It's a provocation for war. A month before its publication, President George W. Bush and the Israeli ambassador to the UN separately declared we were in World War III. President Bush attributed its start to 9-11. But one analyst thinks that since both parties who could start the war declared it in May 2006, 
That was its beginning. Let's return to the church now. Masonry and communism were eroding the faith in Italy and Rome in Pope Leo's time. By the start of the 20th century, the infiltration was seen in the ideals of movements such as the Sion in France, which was, in which was engendering revolution amongst the youth and younger clergy, and which was shut down by Pius X. The Sion promoted a democratic, laicized church, world brotherhood, and the one world religion. Pius X called it a miserable affluent of the great movement of apostasy being organized in every country for the establishment of a one world church. St. Pius X also condemned modernism, which uses communist mind control techniques. Modernism and Sionism unfortunately went underground, and it was impossible to stop the revolution because the Sionist ideas and modernism went through many groups, adopted by many groups and individuals over the decades. Communism, uh, communists were placed in seminaries to become priests and then bishops. Communist infiltration increased in World War II, then through the United Nations. Now, Sister Lucy had not revealed one part of the Fatima message, which became known as the Third Secret. She said it should be revealed by a pope no later than 1960. But again, there was no papal cooperation. As punishment, the church was immediately disoriented by the revolution and joined the great movement towards apostasy. The council was a coup. Masonry, communism, humanism, modernism became official policy. The Vatican-Moscow agreement ensured that the church would maintain silence on communism from then on. Pope John XXIII was an admitted Sionist. His encyclical, Bacham in Terrace, was a Sionist document that began turning the bark of St. Peter off course. The identity of Pacham with communism even brought praise from Khrushchev. Cardinal Ratzinger admitted that God in Metzpes represents the church's attempt at an official reconciliation, official reconciliation with the new era inaugurated in 1789. That is with the new world order inaugurated by the French, uh, Masonic French Revolution. Officially, this put the church on the dialectical path of merging the kingdom of Christ with the kingdom of Satan. In his closing speech to the council, Paul VI admitted this. He said the religion of God had encountered the religion of man who makes himself God, this religion being a pagan and profane humanism, that is, Masonic Marxism. But instead of a clash, he said, the church had embraced this cult of man. That is, a synthesis took place. The church was now humanistic, he proclaimed, and dedicated to worldly needs. As Monsignor Benson forecast, the humanity religion is the only one. Just three years after the council, Pope Paul VI began lamenting its fruits. He said the new orientation had produced confusion, even amongst those exercising the greatest authority. He spoke of a crisis of the faith, affecting religious, moral, and social life, a widespread apostasy, and indeed, the auto-destruction of the church. These are his words. In other words, having joined the revolution, Catholics immediately succumbed, in Pope Leo's words, to apostasy, error, and vice, material miseries, and moral degradation. The road is very short from religious to social ruin, said Pope Leo. And indeed, civilization started disintegrating in the 60s, right after the council or along with it. We got the feminist revolution, the sexual revolution, the drug revolution, rock and roll. A year after the council ended, the dawning of the new age was heralded in the rock musical Hair as an age rooted in the occult and the mind's true liberation. 50 years later, paganism and occultism abound in society and the church. To avoid the diabolical disorientation, we must heed St. Paul. Therefore, brethren, stand firm, 
and hold the traditions which you have learned. A major deception has resulted from man depending on ungodly man for peace. However, two popes were not deceived. On May the 5th, 1917, at the height of World War I, Pope Benedict XV solemnly placed man's last hope of peace in the hands of Mary. A mere eight days later, she appeared at Fatima to show the world that the Pope was absolutely correct in placing his confidence in her alone. She said the war would soon end, but she warned of a worse one to come during the reign of his successor, followed by more wars and punishments if her formula for peace were ignored. Six years after the publication of the Communist Manifesto, Pius IX defined the dogma of the Immaculate Conception saying, all our hope do we repose in the most blessed Virgin who is the most trustworthy helper of all who are in danger. She will remove spiritual blindness from all who are in error. What she asks of God, she obtains. God showed Pope Pius was also right in placing his confidence in Mary alone by sending her to Lourdes to, to declare, I am the Immaculate Conception. Our Lady of Fatima promised the collegial consecration would convert Russia and bring peace to the world. It would obviously destroy the Masonic world order and restore the kingdom of Christ. This would be the triumph of her Immaculate Heart. Right now, we're in the triumph of Russia. What a tragedy that what Our Lady has asked of the Pope and bishops, she has not obtained. Let us hope that it will not take the annihilation of Rome for them to obey Our Lady of Fatima. Thank you.